Welcome back to Book View. Joining us this week is Heather Poole. She's the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Cruising Attitude, Tales of Crash Pads, Crew Dramas, and Crazy Passengers at 35,000 Feet. And you go into great detail about a few of your New York crash pads. Now let's start with what is a crash pad, and, and how does that actually work? Well, there's all kinds. Well, first of all, a crash pad is just a place where you crash between trips. So there are all different kinds. <laughs> the cheapest might be your friend's couch. Um, then uh, from that, you might share a bed. It's called a hot bed, only because the bed is kept warm. Because when you leave, you take your sheets off, you put them in a drawer, and then somebody else comes in and puts their sheets on. Then you can pay a little more and have your own bed so you can leave your sheets on. And then there's, of course, you could have your own room, which is very rare. Um, and so, I mean, you've got crash pads mixed with pilots. You have just crash pads with all flight attendants, all girls, crash pads, all guys. There's so many different kinds. It's so weird. And these are just basically like army barracks with bunk beds with a little bit of like sorority party mixed in because you're wearing Chinese food at night with whoever's there. And sometimes you, you're meeting people for the first time. Now, I was laughing out loud at the naked owner on his bare rug who owned your first crash pad when you went to pay him. And in New York City, there were crew members who actually lived in the operations center. Tell us about that senior flight attendant who actually had a chair that no one could ever sleep in. And she actually brought her own lamp and chest of drawers? Well, the, first of all, I have to make clear that, you know, after 9-11, the whole living in the airport thing has changed greatly. So unless the airport has a flight operations outside of security, you can't live there anymore. But at Kennedy and my airline, we do still have that outside of operations. So people do still sleep at the airport. Like, they live there. It's, it's really nuts. Well, take that back. These are commuters. So they actually live elsewhere. So they back up their trips. And, but in between trips, they will sleep at the airport for like, and it's only like five or six hours. But still, and yeah, there is one flight attendant who's famous for sort of owning her one chair. And you know it's her chair because she has a chest of drawers beside it and a lamp she brought for home. And apparently, if you're too loud, she'll flash you with her flashlight. Um, she's pretty famous. I heard a really funny story once where this guy was and went to sleep in operations and he had never been there before. So he was didn't know who owned which seat. And he sat in a chair and in the middle of the night he woke up. He felt like maybe there was an earthquake happening. Then he realized that these two older flight attendants were pushing his chair across the floor. He was shaking because he was in the wrong spot. And then they pushed their two seats together. And <laughs> I don't know. I think it's because, you know, our lives are so inconsistent. We don't have routines at the the small time that we can create a routine, we do. And maybe that explains what's going on there at the airport with those recliners. Now, Heather, you're a commuter from west to east coast. Explain how your day can actually start with a six-hour transcontinental flight before you actually start working on a flight. And, and where is it that you actually fly these days? It's just... The thing that's really still very much appealing about the job is that you can make it what you want. And the flexible schedule is a big deal. So some people will work two days on, three days off. But as commuters, we usually will back our trips up. Work. I work like seven days in a row and then I'm off for like seven days so I can make the most of my time on the ground. So, And the older I get, the less daring I get. I used to like fly in at the last minute and then just jump on my flight and work it. Now I'm like, then I was starting to commute to New York the day before at night. Now I kind of go in the middle of the afternoon because the flights are full. It's very stressful. Flights are full. You don't know if weather's going to cancel it. And I got to get to work. But why do I do it? Because in New York, it's the most junior base and I have some seniority. And if I can hold a good trip, I can get rid of it a lot easier so I can manipulate my schedule better. Plus, I'm off reserve and reserve is hell. I don't know if I can say that on this show, but... It's just you want to do everything to be off reserve. And that means I will fly six hours out of my way to be off reserve. Everyone has these impressions of flight attendants living a glamorous life of travel, loves, fine dining, dancing the night away. But the reality can be very different. Talk about how the airlines treat their service and how the professional standards have changed, demands that are placed on you, the various cuts to benefits, pensions, etc. What's it like now working for an airline? Well, it's weird because I feel like, I mean, I've been flying a long time, but it seems strange that I can actually say, I remember when we used to sell, serve Snicker bars and hot rolls and coach and three meals for free. I, I can do that now. 
So yeah, a lot has changed. And it's kind of sad because I just feel like the job is not meant to be worked the way we work it now. And even the most professional person cannot keep that good attitude going for six days straight on a 14-hour day with nothing to eat but a leftover first-class roll and after an eight-hour layover at an airport hotel. Like, it's just not physically possible. And, we have, and we're pushing it because ticket prices are cheaper. I mean, regardless of what everybody says, they are. And so the airlines have had to cut back on flight crew. So they, there's less of us on board and we work longer hours. So it's very tough. And I do miss, I do miss the good old days, but at the same time, I'm still working. Let's talk a little bit about work home balance. Now you mentioned you have a husband and you have a child, um, you know, and, and some people would say, you know, what's there to complain about in your line of work? You work 12 days a month and have all these travel benefits. How do you balance the work home situation? I mean, being gone so long and how does your child adjust? Well, I mean, it is tough and it is, I mean, when I try to explain to other people, they always just shake their head and stare at me dumbfounded like they can't believe what's happening. But I make we make it work and it helps, I guess, that I married a frequent flyer because he gets the job and he knows not to speak to me a day after I've come home, you know, like I need like 24 hours of quiet. And so does he. And, you know, when he's on a trip and he goes and has a nice dinner, I don't get mad or jealous because I'm home with the kids. And I, I know that travel is difficult. Whatever he, whatever he can do to enjoy himself, I think he should go and do because it's not, it sounds and it seems like a glamorous lifestyle, but it is very tough. So it's nice to have somebody who understands that. Also, like my gigantic calendar on the refrigerator is color coded with like my stuff and my husband's stuff. Like we, it seems like we play a game of tag sometimes, like because somebody has to be home to take care of the kid. And luckily, I just have one, and he's really good, and he's not a problem. I mean, he grew up, and you said you were the you're the child of an airline pilot, so it's all he knows. And I tell him, I'm like, all right, I'm leaving, and I'm real sad about it. And I hear him go, woohoo, because you know it's hot dog time with dad, and I don't even want to I don't want to know what's happening when I'm gone, but um. You know, my husband, he's the one who's the most difficult one, not my son. My son's totally fine and happy with it. He gets to, and he's traveled more than anyone I know. Okay, we're going to talk pilots and sex and relationships now. Explain how one earns the title of a cockpit Connie or air mattress and why mixing work and dating pilots is rarely a good idea. You know what I think makes that image so much worse? It's the fact that we end up at a hotel uh, you know, on our layovers. I mean, it doesn't happen any more than it happens in any other job with doctors and nurses and lawyers and court reporters or, you know, whatever. It's not that much different. It's just that it seems so more, much more risque because there we are. And let me tell you, by the time I get to my hotel room, all I want to do is shut the door and go to bed. In fact, we have a term for it. It's called slam clickers. Those are the people who don't, you don't see until pickup. Because you know what? I'm not even kidding. These days, you have to make a choice if you're going to sleep, eat, or shower. Because sometimes you don't have enough for all three. Something has to go. <laughs> so there's not time for pilots. But, yeah, I know. Like, well, you know, And I do work for an airline that is more established and there's more senior flight attendants involved. And when you have more senior flight attendants working for an airline, you have flight attendants that are more willing to take new girls under their wings and tell them what not to do. And I had a flight attendant write down on a beverage napkin for me um, – one, don't do it. Two, don't do it. Three, don't do it. Four, if you do do it, don't do it again. And I think, you know, these ladies speak from experience, <laughs> you know. So the more senior your crew, the probably it's not happening as much as, <laughs> as you might think. Okay, now the rule was to never get involved romantically with a pilot and get rid of any high-maintenance relationship. Now, there's one person in this book I really want to know about. Talk a little bit about Georgia, your training school classmate and pal, and, and her relationship back in North Carolina and how it weighed on her and your working and downtime relationship. And indeed, she was gone in a very short period of time. I like, I like my, a lot of my book is about relationships, some form of relationship. And some of the people who read my book and reviewed it were like, oh, I didn't want to read about all our relationships. But you know what? That's the thing. That's what we give up in this job. And I think the way to better understand my job is to understand what kind of relationships we have and how difficult they can be. And, uh, you know, it starts with dating and, 
And and one of the interesting things are, you know, there are a lot of guys out there, or maybe even girls for pilots, who just date us because of our job, because maybe we're not around as much, and so it's easier to juggle more than one woman. And then the other thing about it is that it takes us a lot longer to realize a relationship isn't working because we're not home. So while it might take a person like five dates to figure it out, you know, my five dates are scattered across two or three months, maybe, I don't know. So yeah, it's difficult. And Georgia was my roommate, my first roommate, and I got along with her so well. I mean, I felt like she was my best friend. I met her in training. We ended up living together. I couldn't really even imagine being in New York without her. And she was what I would, I just, what you would imagine to be the perfect flight attendant. She had a pageant going background. She was beautiful. She was charming. She was funny. And if anything, you, she was the one who was going to make it. She could have been the poster child for the airline. And she quit like three months out of training. And I did everything to make her stay because I didn't want to get left alone. Plus, I didn't want to lose her. And, um, and that's the thing. Like, you either last a lifetime or you last two or three trips because it's just so different than anything that you can imagine. The other interesting thing I learned is that if you wash out, it'll either be very early in your career or you're likely going to be in this game for the long term, for the lifestyle. Now, when we return with part three of our show here with Heather Poole, we'll look at the less than glamorous life of buying your own uniforms, celebrities, and turbulence. All of this when Book View with Dennis Campbell continues. Stay right here.